It rained on four of the following seven days. It was the longest, most miserable week of Mandy's young life. She wept copiously at first. Many times she contemplated leaving the orphanage and running away to the cottage. Matron Bridie would be sick with worry about her, but no one would ever find her. She would live at the cottage forever, and it would serve Matron right. Eventually, common sense prevailed, and she resigned herself to waiting out the week. Sue seemed very concerned and really tried to be helpful. That was almost the worst part of all, for then Mandy longed to break down and tell her friend everything. She ached for sympathy and understanding. But she remained silent, and that was the very thing guaranteed to change Sue's mood and make her almost antagonistic toward Mandy. She talked at Mandy rather than to her. I just felt something was going on, Mandy. I knew you'd get into trouble sooner or later. Let's not talk about it, Sue. Besides, it's not right for you to be off by yourself all the time. Everybody's noticed it. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. The girls avoided each other the rest of the week. Mandy nearly wept all over again when she finally saw her beloved cottage. She was so overjoyed at being there once more. But when she opened the kitchen door, she received the most awful shock. There, in the muddy earth, just outside, were two distinct, large footprints. They must have been made recently, otherwise the rain would have washed them away. They were big, probably made by a tall man's shoes or boots. Mandy felt scared for the very first time since she discovered the cottage. Who could possibly have been wandering around the place? Was he a tramp or a burglar? Mandy found herself looking over her shoulder many times as she sat before the fire. Perhaps it wasn't someone bad. Perhaps it was the prince, the one she imagined lived in his castle somewhere in these same woods. On her way back to the orphanage, she traced the ground carefully, looking for other footprints or clues. She almost jumped out of her skin when she stumbled upon the clear print of a horseshoe. So, someone had been riding to the cottage. Mandy was excited. It couldn't have been a tramp. A tramp wouldn't ride a horse. But a prince would. So her guess was probably right. She tried to picture him. What would a prince look like? For several days she looked for other signs but found none. The beautiful dear Snow came to visit again, though. He usually went to the stream late in the afternoon. Mandy always stopped whatever she was doing to watch him. Wondered if the deer belonged to the prince. Did the prince feed him and stroke him and have him near always? It was comforting to feel that the animal was a presence they shared. Matron informed Mandy that she would deduct six weeks of her pocket money in order to pay for a new pair of shears. When all was said and done, Mandy felt that she had been let off lightly, and she had still managed to keep her secret. November came roaring in with gusty winds and more wet weather. Mandy's depression would not go away. Her garden seemed sad, too. Most of the trees were bare, and the woods had a wet carpet of leaves. The cottage was damp and cold. Mandy kept a fire going as often as possible. She longed for the spring to come again, for sunny days and a time when she could plant her garden once more and watch it grow. Matron informed her that she could now keep her earnings from the Jennings store. The shears were paid for. Mandy immediately purchased more matches and a lot of candles, she often did her homework by their flickering light. In the cottage in the late afternoon, Mandy sat in an empty room with only her books and a fire for company. The weather remained cold. Mandy woke one Sunday morning to discover frost on the ground. She ate a hurried breakfast and slipped away to the cottage. She ran to keep herself warm, but running made her chest hurt, so she slowed to a walk. 
she wished she had put on warmer clothes and some gloves. When she reached the clearing, she paused. The cottage looked pretty in the pale morning light. For the best part of a year, she had cherished and loved this special place. It was her very own, and still no one knew her secret. She crossed the wet clearing, opened the garden gate, and walked up the path. Suddenly she spun around in her tracks. She had never opened the gate before. It had been broken. Now it was mended and had a shiny new black latch. Her heart turned somersaults. Who could have mended this gate? And why? She fetched a saucepan and filled it with clear, icy water. Then she boiled it on the trivet over the fire and made herself tea. The hot liquid tasted good, but it hurt when she drank it down. She realized that she'd been experiencing a sore throat for the past two days. She really hadn't been conscious of it until now. She didn't stay long at the cottage. Today she had a desire to return to the security of the orphanage. She couldn't get rid of the premonition that something was about to happen. Strangely enough, something did happen. First of all, Mandy came down with a cold. It didn't seem anything to worry about, though, so she said nothing to Matron or Ellie. The other something that happened was far more important. On her next visit to the cottage, she received the most incredible surprise. Her garden had magically been cleared of all the weeds and dead flowers. The box hedges had been trimmed and the lawn clipped. The Michaelmas daisies by the door were untouched and so was the rose tree. Feeling already fuzzy from her cold, Mandy had the distinct impression that she was in the middle of a strange and wonderful dream. Who could possibly have done this marvellous work? Then Mandy received the biggest surprise of all. Nailed to the door jam was a note, a plain piece of white paper with capital letters printed on it. Her heart thumping, Mandy removed the paper carefully and read, For the little girl who comes here, hope you like the garden. And it was signed, An Admirer. Golly! Mandy spoke out loud. Hardly knowing what she was doing, she wandered around the garden in a dazed state, touching the gate and its new latch and smoothing her hand over the short, clipped grass. She fingered the note lovingly and read it over and over again. Her excitement was so great that she wanted to shout out loud, Everything is all right now! Whoever had written the note must be kind and generous and good, not someone to frighten and hurt her. Mandy was convinced now that he was her prince. Who else could have managed surprises of such magnitude? What a lovely world it was. All night long she lay awake, wondering whether she should confide in Sue or maybe Ellie. This intense excitement was worse than any Christmas Eve. Mandy wearily decided that she would keep her secret to herself. It was still too risky. If Matron found out, or if Sue couldn't keep the secret, the whole orphanage would know in no time. The next morning, Mandy wished that she didn't have to go to school. Her cold was worse. But there was a problem. If she admitted to a cold, she would be kept at home. That would mean no trip to the cottage at all. She tried to behave as though nothing were wrong. It seemed that school would never come to an end. She was not interested in writing and mathematics and basic grammar today. When the school bell finally rang, she could have run to the cottage had she not been so tired. All was serenely quiet when she arrived. Perhaps an admirer was not able to come every day. Then, as she walked through the door into the cottage, she gave a cry of joy. 
In the middle of the living room floor was an object wrapped in cellophane. It was a huge chrysanthemum plant, all russet and golden blooms bursting with life. Nestled among the swayed soft leaves, there was another note. With trembling fingers she read, Flowers for my dark-haired friend to put in the garden because I took so many away. An admirer. She was just about to remove the cellophane from the flowers when she sensed a movement behind her. She spun around quickly and saw a dark shape silhouetted against the light. She screamed. Sue was standing in the doorway. Hey, I'm sorry. Did I frighten you? Mandy was speechless. I followed you from school, Sue said by way of explanation. I could just tell you had something to do today. You couldn't concentrate for anything. She stepped into the room. Gosh, this is really neat. Mandy found her voice. It's mine, she said. So, how did you find it? Oh, I just did. Mandy felt a wave of anger. Is this where you've been coming every day? Sue excitedly moved toward the shell room door and gasped as she opened it. Wow! Look at this! Get out of there, Mandy said, with such vehemence that Sue looked startled. What's the matter with you? You shouldn't have followed me. You had no right to come just barging in here. That's a mean and sneaky thing. Sue interrupted. Well, you're not supposed to be here either. Mandy was becoming confused. This is my place. Now go away and leave me alone. Go and find some place of your own. She was so angry she began to cry. Then she started to cough. She felt simply awful. The worst thing was that even should she be able to make Sue go away, she knew about the cottage now. Nothing could change that. It spoiled everything. There's no need to get so upset, Sue was saying. You look awful. Are you all right? Of course I am. It's just that you make me so angry. It's all your fault. Well, how was I to know? Oh, where'd you get these? Sue pointed to the chrysanthemums. I bought them. How'd you get the money? I saved it. Mandy desperately cast about in her mind for something to distract the other girl. And she felt so sick. She began to cry again. Sue looked at Mandy and then said, I think we should get out of here. We ought to go home. Matron doesn't know where we are. Don't you tell her! Mandy became almost hysterical. You're not to tell her! All right, all right, I won't. Sue seemed anxious now and began to pull Mandy outside. I think you're getting sick. You really look sort of queer. Let's go, Mandy, please. Mandy willingly let herself be led away. If you don't say anything, she babbled, I'll show you the cottage another time, but you must let me do it because I found it. Maybe I'll let you share it too. Mandy would have promised Sue anything at this point. She wished she could get rid of this fuzzy feeling in her head. Matron worriedly accosted them the minute they entered the house. Where have you two been? What's the matter, Mandy? What happened? Mandy opened her mouth to speak, but Sue broke in first. She's not feeling very well, Matron. We, um, stayed at school for a while, and th then I brought her home. Matron placed a hand on Mandy's brow. You're running a fever, child. Go and get into bed immediately, she said. Sue, Run and tell the cook to make a hot drink. I'll bring you some aspirin in a moment, Mandy. It was the most exquisite relief to lie down in bed between the cool sheets. Was she getting really sick? Mandy realized that she was still clutching the note from an admirer in her hand. She read it again. It was a great comfort. At least this was one thing Sue didn't know about. Matron came in with a hot drink and some aspirin. She took Mandy's temperature. Hmm, not too bad. 
But that's a nasty cough, Mandy. You'll have to stay in bed until I say you can get up. Oh, but Matron, Mandy sat up, suddenly concerned. I can't stay in bed. Matron feigned surprise. You can't, she smiled. No, I, uh, oh, please don't make me. I hate it so. Mandy couldn't find the right words. Uh, I really don't feel too bad at all. Matron sat down on the edge of the bed. Well, we'll see how you go. It won't be for so very long. I've asked Dr. Matthews to stop by in the morning. He'll take a look at you. She folded her hands. But, Mandy, I'm afraid I must ask you not to stay outdoors as much as you have been doing. You're out all day long. We never see you. I don't want it to continue. I'm sure that's why you've caught this chill. Mandy was beside herself with grief. No, no! Mandy! Matron's voice was firm. When the warmer weather comes again, we'll discuss this matter. Until then, I do not want you staying out until all hours. You are to return home immediately after school, and you're to stay in the orphanage vicinity on weekends. Is that understood? Matron's words left Mandy feeling utterly desolate. Her whole being was centered around the cottage, and now that such exciting things were happening, she shouldn't be prevented from going there. But what could she say to Matron? Mandy had no desire to tell anyone about an admirer. She was terrified that he would disappear if she so much as breathed a word. And what of Sue? Would she just investigate the cottage by herself? Matron hadn't said anything to her about not going out. Mandy eventually fell into an exhausted and fitful sleep. She never heard Sue get up and leave for school the following day. It was late when Matron Bridie bustled in to wake her up. Good morning, good morning, she flung wide the curtains. Dr. Matthews is here to see you, Mandy. Do you think you can wake up? Dr. Matthews' big frame filled the doorway. Well, now, what have we here? Someone not feeling too well? Mandy managed a weak smile. She liked Dr. Matthews. He exuded warmth and cheerfulness wherever he went. He wore a dark jacket and faintly striped trousers. She noted that he had a diamond tie pin. He always looked as if he had just come from a wedding. He sat down beside her on the bed. Anything to tell me? he asked. What's been happening in your young life lately? He watched her closely. Oh, nothing much. Mandy wondered what he would think if she told him about the cottage. She wished she could tell him. Dr. Matthews examined her chest and back. He looked into her throat and her nose and her ears. He smelled of antiseptic and expensive toilet water. She liked the feeling of comfort he gave her. Now, my dear, you're really not too bad at all. But do as Matron says and stay in bed. You'll be right as rain soon. He looked down into her troubled face. Bending slightly, he cupped his hand under her chin. You're sure there's nothing you'd like to tell me, nothing on your mind? For an aching moment, Mandy's eyes brimmed with tears. If she could just unburden herself to someone. She shook her head and said simply, I... Don't like to see you go so soon. Oh, Mandy, neither do I. But I have to get to the hospital. I'll look in on you this evening, though. Maybe we can spend a little more time together then. She watched him gather up his instruments and stride briskly to the door. He winked at her and went out of the room. She listened as he walked quickly down the hall, and then she heard him talking quietly to Matron. She couldn't hear what they were saying. How is she, Doctor? Well, I want her kept in bed for a few days. She does have a fever and also some faint sounds in her chest that bother me. But I'll keep a close watch on that. I'll drop by this evening. Anything special that we should do? No, no. Keep her on plenty of liquids and rest, of course. Have this prescription made up for her. He scribbled rapidly on a pad. If she's not improved in a day or two, I'll have her brought into the hospital for some x-rays. 
He lowered his voice. She seems a bit sad. A little sorry for herself, perhaps. Yes, I've been terribly concerned about her for some time. She's been so evasive. I can't seem to reach her. Something's troubling her. She looks as if she didn't sleep a wink last night. Hmm. I wonder what goes on in that head of hers. She's a sweet child. Dr. Matthews looked at his watch. Oh, Hannah, I must dash. I'm late already. Thanks for stopping by, Brian. No trouble. See you tonight. Mandy lay in bed all morning, staring through the skylight at the grey clouds scudding by outside. What was she to do? Dr. Matthews had said to stay in bed until she was better. What if an admirer left another note for her today? What if he returned later to discover that it hadn't been received? Suppose he gave up trying to communicate with her after a while. Ellie brought her in some lunch, and she picked at it listlessly. If only she could somehow leave a note for an admirer, tell him that she was confined to bed, that she was forbidden to visit the cottage any more, he would surely understand. She would leave the orphanage address on the note, too. Then one day they could arrange to meet, perhaps in the spring. But how was she to get the note to him? If only she could visit the cottage just once more. What if Sue didn't return from school, but went straight to the cottage to see it again for herself? It was possible that an admirer would leave a note for Mandy, as he had before, and Sue would discover it. She had to get to the cottage herself. Today. Mandy pretended great fatigue. She told Ellie that she thought she would sleep all afternoon and asked if she would mind leaving her alone until she woke up and called for her. Ellie was only too delighted. She pulled the curtains in Mandy's room and made a big fuss about tucking her in and getting her comfortably settled. Please close the door, Ellie, so I don't hear any noise. Right-ho, sleep well, Mandy. Mm, thank you. Mandy waited a good five minutes. The big house seemed very quiet. None of the older children were home from school yet. The younger ones were either resting or attending classes. She got out of bed as quietly as possible and pulled on some slacks and a sweater. She was nervous and her legs felt wobbly. She stuffed a pillow into her bed and rearranged the covers in such a way that anyone looking from the door would think she was huddled under the blankets fast asleep. Pulling open her bedroom door, she looked down the corridor. Not a soul in sight. She stealthily made her way down the stairs. She could hear Alice in the kitchen talking to Ellie. A typewriter clacked in Matron's study. Quietly, Mandy opened the side door and was greeted by a blast of cold air. She hesitated. The cold air penetrated her clothing, making her aware how feverish and vulnerable she was. But she had come this far, and it was imperative that she leave some word for an admirer. If she kept moving, she would stay warm. She hurried through the orchard, keeping low in case someone spotted her. She came to the foot of the big wall and looked up. She hadn't noticed how really high it was until today. Shivering, Mandy grasped for the familiar footholds and slowly pulled herself to the top. The wind sighed through the orchard. The branches of the apple tree whipped across her face. She had just lowered herself to the ground on the other side when the deluge began. The rain poured down. Fearful and already soaking wet, Mandy wondered what she ought to do. She didn't have the energy to climb back over the wall. It was better to push on toward the cottage. The driving rain obscured everything, and for a moment she was even unsure that she was going in the right direction. 
But then a flash of lightning split open the sky, and she saw for an instant the clearing and her little cottage brilliantly illuminated in the furious downpour. She ran the last hundred yards or so and stumbled through the doorway, just as the rumbling thunder crashed out directly overhead. Mandy was soaked to the skin. Her teeth were chattering. She felt horribly dizzy, and she had a sharp pain in her chest from running so hard. Inside the cottage, it seemed unusually dark. The stormy sky made it seem like night instead of mid-afternoon. She went to the kitchen cupboard and fumbled for matches. She found candles and lit them. They flickered fitfully in the draught. Was there another note from an admirer? Mandy wandered through the house, looking for some sign that he had returned. She found none. Possibly he hadn't come because of the bad weather. She was concerned about being so wet. The first thing to do was to get dry somehow. She gathered the last of her firewood and managed to get it burning in the grate. She huddled close to it, her clothes steaming but the warmth made her feel sick, and she moved away. She wished there were somewhere she could lie down. She began to talk aloud in order to comfort herself. I shall write my letter. That's the most important thing. Then I shall try to get home. The thunder rumbled overhead. Mandy began to worry that she would not make it back through the woods. What I'll do is just rest here a while. The storm will go away, and, and then it will be easy. She found a pencil and some paper and wondered what she should say to an admirer. Her hand was shaking. She printed as best she could, Dear Sir. It didn't look right on the paper, and she crumpled it up and tossed it on the fire. On a fresh piece, she wrote, Dear Admirer, I am not feeling well and cannot come to the cottage any more. She hesitated, then crumpled that piece of paper up too. What a silly thing to write. What would an admirer think of her? Just because she was sick didn't mean that she couldn't come to the cottage ever again. Mandy wished that she didn't feel so muddled. She began again, laboriously. Dear friend. The words seemed to blur in front of her. Oh, dear she looked up and saw the flickering candlelight playing over the luminous shell walls. The lightning flashed, and through the window the bare trees were silhouetted against the turbulent sky. Mandy held her breath in panic. She wished now that she had waited for Sue before coming to the cottage. Oh, if only there were someone here to talk to! Mandy wondered about the beautiful dear snow. Was he alone out there, trembling and frightened by the noise and the lightning? Perhaps the prince had taken snow into the castle for warmth and shelter. She hoped so. Why had she come? To write the letter, of course. But how silly! The prince couldn't possibly come here in this bad weather. What was so important about a letter? Something to do with Sue? Oh, and Matron would be so angry. <laughs> Dear friend, I am very sick, and I'm worried that a stabbing pain went through her chest, and Mandy was suddenly very short of breath. The room spun about her. The fire had burnt out. Flashes of light, and the walls seemed to be coming in close to fall on top of her. Ah, go away! Dark shadows all around, a shape in the corner like a man, 
arms raised high. This is my house, she thought. Get out! Oh, please don't frighten me so. Mandy's panic was suddenly so great that she managed to stumble to her feet. She had to get away from the cottage. She must get home. She flung the shell room door wide. The lightning split the sky once more, and she sank to the floor. Mummy! She heard herself crying. Oh, Mummy! And then black, spinning darkness engulfed her. Matron Bridie stared at Ellie. What do you mean, she's not there? she asked. What well, just that, ma'am. I went up to wake her, like you said, but she's not in her bed. Well, she's probably in the bathroom. Did you look? Yes, I... Ma'am, her bed had the pillow all stuffed down, like it was meant to be her, still lying there. What on earth is that child up to? Matron swept past Ellie and climbed the stairs to the attic bedroom. She wanted to see for herself. The pillow lay neatly beneath the covers, looking very much like a body asleep. Mandy? Matron called the name once in the darkened room. Slowly she made her way down the stairs again. Ellie was waiting at the foot of the stairway. Dr. Matthews is here, she said. Matron paused a moment and then said, Come with me, Ellie. She walked into her study. Dr. Matthews was standing by the fire. He was shaking drops of rain from his hair and wiping his forehead with a handkerchief. My God, it's a dreadful evening out there. I got soaked just coming in from the car. Brian, a very worrying thing has happened. Mandy is missing. Ellie went to her room to wake her up and she wasn't there. What? A pillow has been left deliberately between the sheets of the bed. It looks as though she meant us to think that she's still there. But why would she do that? Surely she didn't go outside. I've no idea. I, I can't see why she would on such a terrible day, unless she was delirious or sleepwalking or something. She seemed fine, Matron, when I put her down to rest, Ellie spoke up. But good God, if she's out in this weather, the doctor spoke anxiously, she'll come down with pneumonia in two seconds flat. Matron turned to Ellie. Ellie, I want you to look all over the building. Maybe she went to the kitchen to see Alice. Try there first. Oh, and Ellie, find Sue and send her to me, will you? Ellie hurried out. Why Sue? The doctor was surprised. Oh, just a thought. She and Mandy are very close, and something about the way they came home from school yesterday... Matron thought back to the moment when she had seen them entering the big house. Mandy had not only looked sick, but she had seemed upset and distraught. The doctor drew a pipe out of his pocket and lit it. Don't worry, Hannah, she can't have gone far. There's probably some very simple explanation for all of this. There was a knock on the door, and Sue came in. Matron tried to hide her anxiety. Sue, here's a fine thing. The doctor's here to see Mandy, but we can't seem to find her. Sue looked from the doctor to the matron and back again. She hesitated. Have you seen her at all? No, I, um... Ellie told me not to disturb Mandy because she was sleeping, so I stayed downstairs when I got home. Ah, then we have no idea how long she's been gone. Dr. Matthews looked significantly at Matron. Sue, this is very serious. Matron spoke slowly and clearly. Mandy must be found, otherwise she could become very ill. Do you have any idea where she might be? Well, she may have gone back to the little cottage in the woods. Matron was aware that she must have had an incredulous look on her face. Uh, what cottage in what woods? Uh, the one over the wall, ma'am. 
You mean over the big orchard wall? But why would Mandy go there? Dr. Matthews cut in. Isn't that part of the big estate? A man called Bill Fitzgerald just bought it. Matron sat down in the chair by her desk. I think you'd better tell us all you know, she said. Sue told them about following Mandy to the cottage and how Mandy had begged her not to say a word to anyone. Dr. Matthews was plainly puzzled as to why it was all so important, but Matron Bridie understood. She realized now why Mandy's behavior had been so strange, why she would need to steal the cups and saucers and knives and forks. Alice had mentioned Mandy's requests for dusters and a broom, and Jake had spoken of Mandy's interest in a garden project. Now it all fitted together. She pictured Mandy, flushed and anxious, saying, You mustn't stop me from going, you don't understand, when she had forbidden her yesterday to take any more long walks. Those long walks had been to the cottage, a place that she had tried to make her very own. Matron Bridie reflected that in all her years at the orphanage, she had never seen a child express her desire for a home and a family more vividly. Matron spoke quietly. Thank you, Sue. You've been a tremendous help. Now I want you to be very grown up and not say a word about the cottage or Mandy or that she's missing to anyone. Do you think you could do that? Sue nodded. Will Mandy be all right? Will you be able to find her? Yes, I think so. We'll tell you the minute we do. Ellie knocked on the door and came in hurriedly. Matron, she's positively not in the house. I really looked everywhere. Yes, Ellie, I think we know where she is now, thanks to Sue. Run along, both of you. It's almost dinner time. When they had gone, Matron looked across at Dr. Matthews. Oh, Brian, I'm very much afraid that I'm going to have to call the police. She reached for the phone. No, no, wait a minute, Hannah. The doctor spoke quickly. If Mandy is on the Fitzgerald property, then the person to call is Bill Fitzgerald himself. He can reach Mandy far more quickly than the police can. They'd have to get his permission to go to the cottage anyway. We need to reach the child as fast as we can. Matron hesitated. I have their number, the doctor said, taking a small diary from the inner pocket of his coat. Here we are. Ah, Fitzgerald. Cranton House? Yes, it's 42731. As she dialed the number, Matron Bridie prayed that Mr. Fitzgerald would be able to help and that they would find Mandy soon. Bill Fitzgerald looked at his pretty wife, Anne, sitting across from him at the dining table. He thought how nice it was to be having dinner with her in this cosy room. A fire was blazing in the grate. The silver shone in the candlelight. Samson, the butler, putted at the sideboard, handling the warm plates and covered tureens with accustomed assurance. He was the complete opposite of his biblical namesake. Old and tall and thin as a reed, he'd been with the family many years. Bill looked out at the rain beating against the sash windows. It was driving so hard that the park at the back of the house was completely obscured. It was dark early tonight. Good to be indoors at such a time. He was glad of the break for dinner. All through the late afternoon, he had been working in his study, trying to plan and shape the future and draw up a suitable budget for the big estate. He turned back to Anne. What date does Jonathan finish school? Mm, the 16th, I think. <laughs> I can't wait to see his face when he sees this house. Oh, he'll love it, as I do. It's so beautiful here. Anne smiled across at him. Happy? Yes. Her eyes were warm and affectionate. Samson came across the room carrying a silver platter. He bent and offered it to Anne. As she helped herself to the thinly sliced meat, a telephone in the hallway began to ring. Oh, dash it! Bill drew a weary hand across his eyes. Why does everyone choose the dinner hour to phone? Sam, take it, will you? Tell whoever it is that I'll have to call back. Yes, sir. 
The old man placed the meat platter carefully on the sideboard and went quietly out of the room. Anne got to her feet. Here, darling, I'll serve. No sense in all this getting cold. She placed the steaming food in front of her husband. How did you manage this afternoon? Are we going to be able to cope financially? Bill grimaced. Just. It'll mean really pulling in our belts, using as much stuff as we can get from the home farm, that sort of thing. Think you can manage on a reduced allowance for a while? Anne nodded. It's worth it. Samson came back into the room. Sorry, sir. It's the matron from the orphanage on the phone. I told her you were at dinner. She apologized and said she must speak with you right away. Bill made a sound of exasperation. Ah, oh, wouldn't you know it. I'm sure she just wants to introduce herself or make an appointment to visit. He got up reluctantly. All right, I'll take it. He strode quickly into the hall and picked up the telephone. This is Mr. Fitzgerald. What can I do for you, matron? Oh, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Fitzgerald, but, but something quite dreadful has happened here. I was hoping you could help me. We've just discovered that one of my girls is missing. It's hard to tell how long she's been gone. The worst part is that she's sick. She had a fever this morning, and I can't imagine what made her get up and leave the orphanage. Good Lord. Is she dark-haired, about ten years old? Yes, Matron sounded surprised. One of her friends thinks she may be in an old building in your woods. The shell cottage, Bill murmured. Yes, yes, that's it. Oh, do you think you could check for me? She could be seriously ill by now. I'll get on to it right away. I'll call you back. Give me your number. Bill scribbled hastily on a pad. Right. Now, if I find her, I'll bring her here. Could you call the doctor? Dr. Matthews is with me now. He could come immediately. Good. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Bill hung up the phone and returned to the dining room. Anne, a terrible thing. You know that girl I told you about? Well, she's from the orphanage. They think she's at the Shell Cottage. She's sick and running a fever. You mean she's out there now? The matron's frightfully worried. Darling, I'll need my raincoat, quickly. I must go and see if I can find her. Should I come with you? No, uh, no, I'll have to take the mare. The car would never get through. Bill ran across the hall and down a passageway leading to the stable yard. Brendan! he shouted from the porch. Sir! the groom appeared at the door of the tack room. Saddle up the mare! Anne hurried out onto the porch with Bill's raincoat over her arm. I brought your hat too, darling. You'll need it. Oh, take care, my love. Anne's face was clouded with anxiety. I'll turn down a bed and put some water on to boil. The child might need a hot drink. I'll keep your dinner warm. Thanks. Oh, uh, the doctor is coming on over here. He was at the orphanage when the matron rang. Brendan! Coming, sir! Bill jammed his hat on his head. There was a clatter of iron hooves on the cobblestones. Brendan ran out, pulling the big mare behind him. She was reluctant and nervous in the driving rain. Bill swung up into the saddle. Whoa there, whoa, easy girl. The animal skittered and slid on the wet cobbles. Open the gate to the back, Brendan, and get me a lantern. Yes, sir. The big gate swung wide slowly. The wind was howling around the corners of the yard. Anne stood on the porch, her face white against the darkness. She waved anxiously. Bill raised an arm in farewell. The cold rain was already beginning to trickle down his neck. He turned up the collar of his coat and pulled it more tightly about him. Brendan hurried out with a lantern. Be careful, sir! Yes, tell Mrs. Fitzgerald to turn on as many lights on the park side of the house as she can. It'll help me coming back. Yes, sir! God, what a night! Bill bent his head to screen his eyes from the rain and urged the big mare into a canter. They went streaking out through the tall, white gates and disappeared into the pitch blackness. 
Something was making a terrible noise. It was banging loudly and insistently. Get up! Get up! Get up! It seemed to be saying. Mandy lay on the floor of the cottage, reaching out for something to hold on to until the world stopped spinning. She could not lift her head. It seemed the heaviest part of her body. She must be in the middle of some terrible nightmare. Get up! Get up! Get up! Oh, stop the noise! Please stop! The banging noise was coming from directly above her head. She managed to look up. A strand of rose tree was whipping in the wind against the frame of the doorway. Sharp, cruel lashes. Get up! The sky outside was vividly bright for a moment, and Mandy shivered as the inevitable thunder followed. Such a spinning in her head. Round and round went the room, then up and down like a roller coaster, first one way, then the other. And more flashing lights. One like a beacon in the dark. And something else, tall and straight, silhouetted, standing still out there. She closed her eyes, and when she opened them again, the vision came into focus. It was a knight on horseback. It was her prince. Had he worried about her in the storm and come to rescue her? Mandy cried out, Ah! The light swung around in her direction, and she knew that he had seen her. But the tall shape wasn't a prince. It was a giant with long legs and feet so large that they swallowed up her garden in three strides. Mandy backed away. Arms reached out for her, and she screamed. She couldn't stop screaming. She struggled, but the arms were strong and lifted her high into the air. It's all right, little girl. No one's going to hurt you. Still, Mandy cried out, but she was so weak and exhausted she couldn't fight for long. Little by little, she quieted down and lay still. She whimpered and turned her face away from the driving rain. She felt rough cloth against her cheek. To her surprise, it smelled good and felt warm. The arms about her were firm, holding her tight. She burrowed closer. Rocking gently in the dark night, she sensed the strong body moving with her, and still the voice spoke, soothingly and continuously. There we are, little girl, nearly home now. You'll be all right soon. Everything is over now. There, there, don't cry. And though the pain in her chest and her head was still terrible, and she had never been as ill in her life, Mandy heard the words and knew that the worst was behind her.